a stork's wing. The long, finger-like primary feathers are spread and turned upwards in flight. This reduces the amount of drag, which would otherwise slow the bird down. For birds like storks and vultures, a wing with low drag is critical. It gives them a much better performance as gliders. We've invented a similar trick. Upturned winglets on the end of the wings of modern aircraft serve the same purpose, reducing drag created by vortices spinning off the wing tips. But nature's system is more adaptable. It's automatic. As the airflow increases over the wing, the primaries bend up into just the right position. And multiple winglets are more effective. Using a series of models of a stork's wing, the scientists here worked out the best arrangement of multiple winglets. Then they went a step further than nature. They took away the individual feathers, just leaving a loop at the end of the wing. By extending this idea even further, the scientists made this model, where the whole wing is a loop allowing the plane to fly at walking speed. The real joy of bio-inspired thinking is not always in the obvious, but in the leap to new and unexpected ideas. By understanding the way a stork's primaries work, these scientists have designed a way to make more efficient wind turbines. Based on the design of the stork's wing feathers, they arranged veins in a circle. As they shed their vortices into the center, the veins increase the airflow here. So when a windmill is pulled back into the center of this structure, it picks up speed. Inspiration for new ideas can come from anywhere. There are more than enough ideas just around the house and garden to keep a scientist busy for a whole career. Take the humble fly, for example. It might hold the secrets to new kinds of spy vehicles or search and rescue equipment. To most of us, it's just a germ-carrying nuisance. But look again. It can do things no engineer can. Until a few years ago, scientists had no idea how flies flew, let alone how to copy them. But now the fly's secrets are being unraveled, and it needed a whole new branch of aerodynamics to understand it. Deep in the basement of Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, there's a fruit fly with a half-meter wingspan, a working model submerged in hundreds of liters of oil. The oil behaves like air would over the tiny real fly. Injecting air bubbles into the oil shows the scientists what happens as the insect flaps its wings. An exact replica of the real thing, but at a scale which makes it easier to study. The wing creates spinning masses of air around it. Some of these vortices spin off beneath the wing, producing some lift. But the scientists noticed that one vortex stays attached, just behind the front edge of the wing. And it turns out that this leading-edge vortex is vitally important in allowing the fly to fly. 
This is what generates most of the lift. Understanding how insects fly should mean we can build smaller and smaller flying machines. But so far, machines like Delfly at the University of Delft in the Netherlands is about as small as we can get. Delfly doesn't, at first sight, look like any insect that ever lived. Its two pairs of wings are stacked one on top of the other, not one in front of the other like an insect. But the inspiration behind Delfly came from watching the aerial skills of dragonflies. And it uses the same tricks as insects to fly. Most of its lift comes from a leading edge vortex that forms over its wings, just as in a real insect. Flapping flight was abandoned by aviators before it ever got off the ground. But now, understanding how insects fly, we can build flapping flyers that really fly. And not just fly. In flight, Delphi looks very much like a giant dragonfly. And like the real thing, it can hover. Delphi also carries a tiny onboard camera and his slow, maneuverable flight would make it the perfect reconnaissance machine for confined spaces. Though it's still not as good as the real thing. But as a designer, nature does have one big disadvantage over humans. It can't start from the drawing board each time. It has to work with what it's got. The ancestors of penguins flew through the air whilst today they fly through water. Nature had to take a design adapted for one thing and make it do something else. That penguins can move through the water so easily shows just how effective natural selection is. So penguins might be the obvious creatures to study for designing better ships and submarines, perhaps. But at its best, biomimetics is never that obvious. When it comes to underwater energy efficiency, it's much better to take a close look at sharks. They seem to use far less energy than they should. And to find out why means taking a very close look. Magnified hundreds of times, shark skin is covered in tiny scales, each with a ridge along its center. These ridges trap a layer of water close to the skin which reduces friction as the shark moves through the ocean. One swimsuit manufacturer has now made suits covered in minute shark skin like ridges. Then they analyzed the shape of a swimmer's body and, just as the shark does, only placed ridges where they're most effective. This should, in theory, reduce drag by around 4%. Well, that's not much, but in competition against the best in the world, it might just be enough. At the 2004 Olympics in Athens, Australian swimmers wore these new suits for the first time and kept ahead of the field. Whether it was the shark skin effect or good old fashioned better training is hard to say. But they might just owe this gold medal to one of the ocean's most efficient predators. At first sight, the dumpy little boxfish looks to be the complete opposite of the sleek, streamlined shark. But it attracted the attention of car designers at Daimler Chrysler in Germany. When they studied it more closely in wind tunnels and computer simulations, 
they found that it was very effectively streamlined. And because, like a car, it's shaped like a box, they modeled a car based on the boxfish. When they tested their new boxfish car in a wind tunnel, they found it had 65% less drag than the average family car. But as efficient as nature is, it's never come up with one innovation that we have. The wheel. Wheels are very energy efficient ways to move around. But the problem with wheels is that as the ground gets rougher and rougher, wheels get less and less effective. Nature's solution, on the other hand, has no such problems. Legs. And what insects can do with six of them is truly remarkable. For one thing, the whole system operates on minimal computational power. An insect's brain just tells it when to stop or start and perhaps how fast to walk. But all the complex coordination is done by simpler control units in the legs themselves, a system which turns out to be incredibly adaptable. With just a small change in its control system, this stick insect switches from walking to searching for a new foothold, and then crossing a gap that would stop most robots in their tracks. So at Bielefeld University in Germany, stick insects are put through their paces to see how this system works. Researchers here have found that the stick insect has separate controllers, not just for each leg, but for each joint of its legs. These work with sensors in the legs which fine-tune what amounts to an automated walking system. Exactly what some robot designers are trying to achieve. Harry 2 was built to mimic a stick insect. Each individual leg control unit can be programmed in different ways to test assumptions about how stick insects walk. The more Tarry 2 walks like a stick insect, the closer these scientists are to understanding how the real insect walks. Information which could then be used to make walking robots with insect-like economy. But insects can do more than just walk. They can run at very high speed. This roach can cover 50 body lengths in a second, which is why we only ever catch a glimpse of them. But slowed down more than a hundred times, this unloved pest becomes a source of inspiration. At the University of California in Berkeley, scientists are looking at just how fast different kinds of cockroaches can run. As this death's head roach runs, it turns an air cushioned ball, allowing a computer to measure its performance. And persuading it to run on a treadmill, the scientists can film it in ultra-slow motion to see in detail how its legs work. The legs act like miniature pistons ramming into the ground. And the scientists found that the roach's legs are not stiff like a robot's legs. A certain amount of give seems to make a running roach more stable. Likewise, their sprawling gait seems to be another reason why we don't often see roaches fall over, even when running at high speed. Putting these insights together, scientists at Stanford University in California came up with Sprawlita. Its legs are pistons that mimic the way a roach's legs push against the ground. 
and its legs both give and sprawl.